Welcome back to Keeping It Normal with Emily. I always feel really stupid doing that because I dance in my basement to no music and then I add the music in later. <laughs> so I just feel really stupid sitting here and just dancing to nothing essentially. Hi. Wow. It has been three months since my last podcast episode, which seems insane. You might notice a different background. I'm going to get into that a little bit, but basically that is why the hiatus took place is, well, I'll just tell you, my husband is a dreamer and he is a handyman and it's a passion and a hobby and a skill set of his. And see, the problem was I should have known. I should have known that when I asked him for shelves to hang up my Lego collection, that it would turn into a basement remodel. I should have known. Honestly, that's on me. But that is what happened about three months ago. I asked him, hey, it'd be really cool to have some shelves in the basement. I'm into Legos now. Um, it has become a hobby. <laughs> and next thing I knew, this was built. There is a ceiling in place. There are, everything is painted. We're putting in a floor. I don't know what happened. Really, I, I gave the man an inch and he ran a damn marathon. So it's beautiful. It is stunning, but it has put the podcast on a bit of a hiatus. But I, I think we're back now consistently. I'm hoping so anyway. As you know, I'm the least professional person on the face of this earth. I do, I just do everything last minute. I think the smart thing to do when you start a podcast is to have like 10 episodes, maybe more already recorded, edited, ready to put out, always planning ahead. Usually when I do a podcast and I'm on someone else's, we'll do the podcast and then they say, okay, well, this will be released, you know, in a month or two months. I'm like, oh, okay. Me, I'm like, oh yeah, we recorded today. I'll have it out this weekend because I do everything totally last minute. <laughs> so solo episode for today. I just kind of want to get back in the groove of things. I actually had to take like 30 minutes to try to remember how to set everything up, but I think I figured it out. I think we're good. Another thing, <laughs> I read the reviews. <laughs> oh my gosh. I read the reviews of my podcast. I, I can't remember where this review was. It was, it was probably Apple. I don't know. But basically someone said, <laughs> take a shot every time she says, yeah. But other than that, it's a good podcast. And I was like, what? So I went back and watched an episode when I interview guests. I say the word, yeah, like a hundred, hundred times. In my mind, it's me acknowledging that I'm listening to the person while I'm interviewing them, but it is excessive and I'm going to work on it. And <laughs> it just made me laugh. Don't play that game. You will get, you will die. You will drink way too much and die because I say yes all the time. And I now... I know now some of you are going to go back and listen to episodes and say, oh my gosh, you're right. But that's okay. We're learning and growing, which brings me to the topic of today's episode, which is about aging and change. Why am I bringing this up? Because I'm getting old and things are changing and I don't like it. Basically, my so much change happened in such a short amount of time that it punched me in the it sucker punched me in the face. And I feel like not enough people talk about it. And that is the pain and the torment of losing your childhood home. It's selling, right? I feel like it is something that a lot of people go through. It's very natural. Your parents get older or they retire. Usually it's too much house and they have to sell. Of course, you have stories of people that stay in the house and it stays in the family. But a lot of the time, there will come a time in your life when your childhood home has to sell. And I feel like it was something never really talked about probably because all the people in my family still live in the same house. Like my grandparents still live in the same house that they raised my mom and my aunt in. And I've been over there. My kids have been over there and I don't see them like ever moving. Do you know what I mean? Like that has kind of been the norm in my family. So I don't think it was something I ever really processed or thought about. I'm really lucky that I got to stay in my childhood home for 26 years. We moved into the house when I was like five and I'm 31 now and it just, it's done, it's sold. But it was such a a pain and there was such grief with it that just totally took me by surprise that it was so much deeper than just losing a house. It felt like I was losing part of myself. It felt like I was losing 
my childhood. It was just very odd to think that I was not going to be welcome in this place that I have felt is my home for my entire life, even when I wasn't living there. It's such a trip to drive by and know that I can't walk in the front door. It's not mine anymore. And it's, it's mine. Like it is something that is so undeniably ours and yet it's not anymore. It's, it's so odd, but this happened. My mom basically got news that we knew she was going to sell the house eventually, but she got news that she got a job uh, working on the Appalachian Trail, which is amazing. It's like such a dream come true. And it almost was like, okay, this is the universe. Here's the opportunity. I have, I'm going to sell the house. So, but it was like from the time she found out she got the job to the time she left for the job and had to sell the house two weeks. So it was, it was not a slow process. It was not a, let's get used to this idea. It was like, I got this, it's happening. I'm moving. You have two weeks. Let's take stuff. Let's put stuff in storage. Let's clear out the house, throwing stuff in dumpsters. And it was just odd to see this house get everything slowly taken out of it. And it's just empty and bare. And I have had to cope with all that. Also, by the way, her job was 10 and a half hours away. That was another blow. My mom not being in close proximity anymore. So there was so much change to process all at once. And it was, I am not handling it well still. I, I feel like I'm just grieving and I feel like that process looks differently for everybody. And that's okay. I used to kind of like beat myself up about it. Like get over it. Like it's a house. Um, but what, what was interesting was when I shared these feelings on social media, as I do, I was met with a couple of very interesting things. It seemed like there were two camps of people. So there were people that said, basically told me they're still not over it. Their childhood home sold and it's still like they have never gotten over it. And it has been many, many years, which didn't put my mind at ease. But there were people in that camp. And then the other camp was people who were saying, I've never had what you had. And I hope my kids do. I hope I'm creating that for my kids. And you're so lucky to have had that. So it's this odd feeling of knowing you have this really privileged, amazing, lucky situation to miss this house so much and still be heartbroken. It's like, I can't quite get to that point where I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad. Like what an amazing chapter I had. Like I wasn't ready. Someone slammed the book shut. I wasn't done reading. That's kind of what it it felt like was I was still reading. (laughs) I didn't want the chapter to end. I was enjoying it. Um, And then life came around and just slammed the book shut, which I feel like that happens in a lot of situations. But um, one, it it just has led to a lot of things, right? Um, One was a really cool conversation I had with my friend. Um, Her name is Gwenna. You may know her as Mama Cusses on social media, on the socials. But um, she had texted me and kind of said, I'm so sorry. What's going on with your childhood home? And I said back, I brushed it off as I do all the time. Um, to a lot of people in a lot of situations. I just said, oh, it's fine. I'm going to be fine. And I'm just being sensitive. And she came back with something that just like broke me and healed me all at once. And she just said, yeah, but being sensitive is one of your best traits. And I was like, whoa. And that really allowed me to kind of breathe for a minute and stop trying to and just feel all the feelings and realize that maybe I I am. I am really sensitive and I cry a lot about things and I linger on things and I feel things really deeply. And this is just something that I'm going to have to go through and process. And it's, but it was an experience that I had never thought to think of, had never heard people talk about, of how heartbreaking it is. And it has brought on, I don't know if it's that or if it's just getting older in general, but a lot of A lot of things are now like creeping in, like anxieties that I didn't really have before or think about. And it's almost like in so much change that's happening, I'm like trying to memorize everything because now I know, I think, or I'm I'm more aware at all times that things don't last forever. I feel like when you're little, you don't even think about it. Time is infinite in your brain. You, you're not even thinking 20 years in the future. You're thinking kind of here and now. And then the older you get, that 
window of time lessens and it becomes, you're just more aware of it, I feel like. So there's just lots of things changing. I'm 31. I feel like <laughs> my body has changed drastically this year. And when I talked to other women specifically about it, they were like, oh yeah, my body changed too. Like, I feel like I'm going through a second puberty. Um, my periods are changing. The way I, my body shape has completely changed. The way I carry weight and where I carry weight has completely changed. So I like weigh less than I did, but like none of my clothes fit. It was this really weird thing. I tried on my pants for the summer from last summer that I had bought, you know, I was at the same size and I weighed less and I was like, oh, great. None of them fit. And I'm like, what? I do not understand, but it's because of where I carried weight completely shifted. And, you know, when I sleep now and I don't sleep just the right way, my neck hurts and I'm, I'm noticing that I I'm no longer able to get away with basically just eating whatever I want and not like, I'm like, damn, I really need to start taking care of myself and I don't want to. <laughs> There's just so much that is shifting right now. And like I said, I'm sure the whole childhood home thing and mom moving away and all of the sudden change is not helping that. But I'm having more anxiety. I'm thinking a lot more about death, especially with my grandparents getting older, my parents getting older, myself getting older. And so I was having a lot of kind of anxiety about it and focusing a lot on it, which I don't want to do. No one wants to do that, right? You don't want to think about every time you see like your grandparents, like, oh, they're not going to be around forever. Like that's depressing. But I was having a lot of those thoughts and um, I read a book. Oh, what is it called? I'm going to forget the name. Hold on. Is it being mortal? Aha, it is. Okay. Okay. I found the book because I Googled because I'm an expert. In nothing but I do have Google and it's called being mortal. And I'm going to butcher this man's name by a tool Gawande. If I, I'm sure I said it wrong. I'm so sorry, but it's called being mortal. My friend, um, Rachel, AKA lack of impulse control on the socials recommended it to me. And it's a very interesting read, but what I, what I got out of this book, um, the most is, is we shouldn't like death is just, the one thing, like it's one moment in time. And what we really should be focusing on is all the quality of life leading up to that one moment, you know? And, um, what was interesting in the book, it basically said that when people are faced with an end date with, and that's not necessarily just death, you know, sometimes you think like, oh, you have cancer and you have six months to live. Not necessarily even that, but, but, um, if they knew they were moving, leaving town in two weeks, once there was that end date, the priorities shifted in their life. They didn't care so much anymore about career or personal gain. They're almost universally, no matter what age, their priorities shifted to things like friends and family and personal relationships and things that improved that like quality of life. Um, and so I feel like I've always kind of done that and that reassured me, but I also feel like I'm doing that now just because I'm more aware of in general that things end. Like you're just made more aware of it the older you get, right? And I don't want to fear getting older. There was this whole um, filter that just went viral on TikTok um, where it showed like an AI generated, which by the way, I'm not getting into this on this episode, but AI to me is fucking terrifying. Okay. That's a, that's a side note. That is a different Avenue. I'm not going to go down, but just so you know, that's where I stand, but there was this a, but I use the filter. <laughs> I use the filter, but it basically made your face very accurately. So they say, look old, like what you're going to look like when you're older. And I just, at first I looked at it and was like, I need to, I need to start moisturizing and using some sunscreen because damn, but then I just thought, like, how lucky it's, it is a privilege to age. It is lucky to live that much life, good and bad, ups and downs. I truly think that we are um, lucky to be here. I think they said it's like a, a one in 400 trillion chance or something crazy that you're even here, that you made it to the world. And so I really try to think of that when I'm in 
times of change or pain or hardship or being sad or feeling feelings, just like this is part of it. And it's not fun. It doesn't, doesn't make it any, you know, more enjoyable or, oh, well, it's going to be fine, but it just makes it like, okay, I'm, I'm embracing this part too. I'm embracing the sadness. I'm embracing the, the change and how I'm feeling and grieving. And I'm not getting lost in it, but I'm instead just feeling it. I'm feeling it and allowing myself to feel it. I'm not trying to stifle it. I'm not trying to just push it down and get over it and bury it somewhere deep. I'm just getting through it and still getting through it. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's been tough. It's been a struggle. It's been just open my mind to thinking about a lot of things. And, um, another thing it kind of made me think about was how you never know when it's the last time for something. And you hear that a lot in parenting. Um, I see it a lot in videos and quotes and all the things about how, you know, one of these days that they're not going to ask you to pick them up anymore and you're not going to know when it's the last time. And it's really depressing. <laughs> it's really sad, but it's true. And, and even like my mom's house selling the past, this past Christmas was the last Christmas there. The, you know, Christmas I've had in the same living room since I was five years old. And I have so many amazing memories on about Christmas day and Christmas morning. And we've always gone to my mom's no matter what, you know, and I didn't know that last time was the last time. And we don't know any of those things. So I do try to kind of, you know, live every day like it's my last, but I do try to think of that sometimes because sometimes I wish I could go back and like in time, one time and just be like, memorize this, memorize it. So I started doing something that might sound kind of weird, <laughs> but, um, I, I pick a time, right? So I, um, the most recent example I can think of is my son fell asleep on the couch. And I said to myself in the moment, this is the last time you will ever pick him up and carry him to bed. And I went slow and I picked him up and I just, I made myself memorize how he felt in holding him and how his hair smelled and how his breath smelled and, you know, the dimples on his hands. And I just was like, okay, this is the last time like embrace that and, and feel it. And the thing is I have it's happened many more times since, but in my mind, I have appreciated that moment at some point. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know it wasn't the last time it has happened since, but I don't have to feel like I missed out on the moment or I didn't appreciate it enough while it was still happening. I picked a time and I appreciated it. Now, can I right now imagine, like, can I bring back the smell? No, not necessarily. But I know that my brain experienced it and I know that I took the time to memorize it and feel it and like truly appreciate it before it was gone, if that makes sense. So now I do, you know, I always take the phone call if my parents call or my grandparents call. It doesn't matter. I take the phone call and I send the text when I feel, you know, the urge to tell someone I love them and I give the compliments to the strangers on the street. And when I feel called to do something, a good deed or something, I do it. I just feel like I try to ground myself in those moments and because you don't know when the last time is, but you can make yourself more aware and more appreciative while stuff is happening. I just wish we had and maybe some people do. I didn't. I don't think most do. But I wish we had kind of the knowledge when we were young to to memorize more and to appreciate in the moment more. But like I said, when you're young, time is infinite. It moves differently than when you're older. There's some sort of science behind that, actually. But there, the way you process time is very different when you're younger. It's just not something your brain is thinking of or comprehending. And as you get older, it obviously is. But I... I I do think that's kind of a cool idea that maybe you could do, especially as a parent, because we're really encouraged not to miss a damn moment because it might be the last time. Um, but if there is something that you really are loving and appreciating about this part in your parenting journey to maybe make that mental note of things and take the time to say, okay, I'm truly appreciating this. And then you can say you can. 
Um, but yeah, so, so much, <laughs> so much is changing, getting older. It's crazy to me. Like, can anyone listening, like, can you imagine yourself old? Because I never could. And when I was younger in my warped sense of mind, I was like, well, that just means I'm, I must going to die young because I can't visualize it. I'm still here. I'm still kicking. Knock on wood. But, um, it's just an, an odd thing. And I feel like it happens so quickly. I feel like I'm, oh, this is another thing. I feel like I'm 17. <laughs> my best friend just got married and she, my best friend in the whole world, we've been best friends since we were five and I was a bridesmaid and, um, she wants to have kids and she's, she brought that up and she's like, yeah, but I don't know. You know, she's like, I feel like I'm an imposter or something. She's like, I feel like I'm 17 or 18 or whatever she said. And everyone around me is like a grown up. And I'm like, okay, but I feel the same way. And I have two kids. <laughs> like, I feel like it's a more common experience than we think. And then my mom says she feels like she's like 29 or something for a long time. When she celebrated her birthday, she was turning, you know, 29 for the 16th time or whatever it was. But, um, I feel like that is a thing. And I, I hear elderly people say that too, that they just, in their mind, they are a lot younger than they are. But it's that weird feeling of like, I am just faking this. Like, will there come a time when I feel like a grown up? And if so, when? Because I'm 31 and I don't. Sometimes I look around and I'm like, what happened? Like, I'm married. I have two kids. I have a house. Like, what's, what? they're going to find me out soon. They're going to discover that. I am just winging the hell out of all of this. But then I talk to other people and they tell me the same thing. And I'm like, okay, okay, <laughs> good. It's not just me. But I feel like more people need to say that because I see people and they seem so put together and so adult. And it would, I would love to hear someone like that say, no, nah, I'm just, I'm just winging it. I don't know what I'm doing. I feel like a lot of us are just out here. And how can you not be? Because we're all just living for the first time. None of us have done this before that we know of. <laughs> so I feel like we need to give ourselves a little bit of grace, especially when we make mistakes and when we, when we mess up and we're not perfect at something that doesn't exist. You can't be perfect at everything or anything. But I just feel like we need to give ourselves a little bit of grace in that we are, we haven't been here that long. I'm 31 years old in the grand scheme of things, 31 years is not much at all. And I'm just figuring it out and that's okay. All right. So that is really all I had on that topic for aging and anxiety, <laughs> change, <laughs> heavy topics for me to, for my return episode. I didn't, I jumped right in, didn't I? Right into the deep end. But you guys know I like to do an Ask Emily segment. I put the question out to my Instagram. So if you're not following me, there's a link in the description. But I just ask, hey, here's kind of my topic. Do you have any questions that I could offer my advice? Remember, again, say it with me. I'm an expert in nothing, but I do have Google. Okay, I've got an associate's degree in mass communications and a little bit of life experience, and that's about it. So take what I say with a grain of salt. You might take little tidbits that you can you know, apply to your own life. And if not, that is okay too. But, um, there were a couple questions that stood out to me and I'm not even sure if they really go with exactly what we were talking about, but the first question is, um, is from K underscore LePage. Um, I'm struggling with my decision to, not have kids. I've always longed to be a mom. And after five years of trying, I just don't think it's in the cards for me. Any thoughts? So I, I will say and preface because I like to spread this message. This is exactly why I don't ask anyone anymore if they're having kids, if they are going to have more kids. Um, because you just never know what someone is battling. It's a weirdly personal question to ask someone, quite frankly. It's very invasive. And it's become very normalized in our society to ask someone that, especially once as they're getting older. 
and after they're married. Once they're married, usually people are like, okay, are you having a baby? Um, and I just, I've been in the position of having trouble in that area and having loss and people asking me if I was going to have a baby or have another baby or saying, well, at least you could get pregnant, just saying all the wrong things. So I just want to offer that beforehand because sometimes people don't think about it, especially if you haven't gone through it yourself, but a lot of people have. So I will say this. I, I always wanted kids with every fiber of who I was. And when I, I got pregnant, my first ever pregnancy, I was 21. I miscarried a week into it super early. And then, uh, it was three or four years of trying again after that. And I got to a point where I didn't, I was done. I was like, I can't focus all my energy on this anymore. It's been years. It's all I'm thinking about. And so I basically, um, you know, if you're religious, maybe you talk to God, maybe you talk to the universe, maybe you don't, but I put it up into the universe just saying, Hey, I don't know if this is in the cards for me. If it's not in the cards for me, you know, I might need, I might need some help, a sign or something point me in the right direction because it's what I really wanted. I, I think, you know, I think, you know, yourself, I think, you know, your limits. I think, you know, when you're done and when you're not, and if you're done, you're done. And I feel like, you know, when that happens, no one else can tell you, no one else can make the decision for you. If you're feeling like I'm, I can't put any more energy towards this. It's not in the cards. Then that that may be the decision. And we start healing and we start therapy if we need to um, overcome that. We start pouring that energy into something else. I'll never be the person to say, well, never give up. It could happen because you know your limits. You know when to call the ending and say, okay, I can't give any more to this. So I would just say, and my advice in that instance is trust yourself you know yourself best. No one else knows you better than you know yourself. And if you are feeling like it's at the end of that line, then it is. And then you take steps, you know, next. And if you're not feeling like it's done, then it's not. So I would, I would just say, listen to your own gut and your own feelings on that. Um, the other question I had was, how do you get me time if you are a single parent, no support? So this is what I advocate for on my channel, on my social media. Not anything. I'm not a single parent, but um, you have to put other things aside, which is, can be really challenging, right? But this is kind of something I started. So right now, upstairs, there is laundry to be folded. There are dishes in my sink. There are shoes scattered about. There are little Play-Doh bits on my dining room floor that all of that I could be doing right now. Um, I'm not going to. I'm going to record this podcast because I really enjoy doing it. Um, if I wasn't doing the podcast, I would watch my, you know, one a movie I've been wanting to watch or I would do some Legos, build some Legos, read a book. Um, I tried to make a goal this year that one night a week was a hobby night. Now, have I achieved that every week? No, but for the most part I have. So one day a week was going to be a hobby that I enjoyed doing and everything else was going to be put by the wayside. Everything else, all the chores could wait till tomorrow. Um, I feel like that just has to be done sometimes. Otherwise you're not going to have time for anything. And I also want to make note is we have to change our mindset because so many of us have that mindset of a hobby is a reward or personal time or things I enjoy are a reward for getting chores and getting things done that they shouldn't be enjoyed until those things are done. Like I haven't earned them. I really changed my entire mindset on that, that it was, it was something to be earned. It was something that I deserved if I did X, Y, and Z. 
And I changed it into thinking, okay, how is this? It's productive. Rest is productive. That was a huge one for me to internalize. And that me putting time into myself and things I enjoy and discovering things I enjoy is productive, is worthy. It has value that um, it is important sometimes to put those other things aside that can wait, that can wait until tomorrow and do things that fill my cup and do things that help me discover more about who I am and that bring me joy. You know, at the beginning of this podcast, we really talked about change and how things have endings and life is short. (laughs) Life is long enough that you can do some really amazing things and short enough that you shouldn't put those things off. So I think one of the most important things that you can achieve on earth is happiness, love, joy. Um, During your lifetime, I think those are so incredibly important. And so is kindness. I think that's Um, that can be a person's most powerful legacy is their kindness, but I'm getting off topic, um, is joy. And I, I feel like we put things, we see it as a reward. We see it as something to be earned and it's not, it's something we deserve and it's something that's productive and it's something that's necessary. And I also want to remind you that you don't have to be good at something to do it or enjoy doing it. I really like painting and I'm not very good at it. Maybe I am. I don't understand art, but (laughs) you don't, not everything has to be a job. Not everything. You don't have to get the gold medal and everything you try. If you enjoy doing it, do it. It doesn't even have to be done well. You don't have to excel at it. If you enjoy doing it, do it. So on that note, I'm going to end the episode there. It feels really good to be back. Um, Episode eight of Keeping It Normal, officially. We're we're wrapping it up, but I hopefully will be back weekly from this point. If I'm not, bear with me, but I'm hoping to at least, if not every week, be much more consistent, get some more guests and get this show on the road. So I hope you guys have a wonderful week, a wonderful day, and just know you are worthy and beautiful and amazing. And I'm so glad you're here. Bye.